We're in a series called The Book of Ephesians, From Identity to Destiny. From Identity to Destiny. And uh, how many of you have passports? Pretty important thing to have, by the way, when you leave the country. When you leave the country, it's good to have a passport because you know what? You can't get back in the United States without it. And it's very important as a protection as well that we have a strong country. Well, back in uh, 2009, a situation happened. I'll go ahead and show you what happened. A woman by the name of uh, Sharon, uh, she was in, they were hiking in Iraq, and apparently, they don't know what happened, but some Iranians uh, arrested them and put them in prison and accused them of being spies, etc., etc. And for an entire year, they were in solitary confinement in a horrible prison, not like the prisons we have here. It's bad. I mean, really bad, lost a lot of weight. She was the point of death. But there was something that she had that helped sustain her. She had an American passport. And because she had an American passport, and her mother had it, she used it to her utilization to get help and negotiations to get her daughter out of the Iranian prison. It took a year, but because she had a passport, she got out. And so what really, that's what happened. And in fact, when she got out, this is what she said. Much later, Sarah recounted and having her passport with her was like this, like having a piece of America with me. It was my salvation. Like having a piece of America with me. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you become a citizen of heaven. You become a citizen of a different kingdom. You are now no longer a citizen just of earth, but your primary residence is in heaven. Now, you may not be dead yet, and you may not be in heaven, but your residency is there. You have a passport. And that's who you are. You're seated with Christ in heavenly places. And because you have a passport and because you're part of the kingdom of heaven, you have rights and privileges other people do not have. And if you're not aware of the fact that you have a passport, you may not get the um, help you need. You can claim, wait, I'm a U.S. citizen. You cannot treat me like that. Or, for example, my brother-in-law works right now in, uh, in Finland. He works at the embassy. And so a lot of countries have embassies. It is literally a pocket or it is a, it is a place where the country has a refuge for people that if there's a situation, you can run to the embassy. In 1979, in Iran, there was a rebellion with these radical students of Islam, and they came into the embassy, and they held people hostage for over 444 days. There was over 55 different hostages, and we did everything we could to get them out. Finally, in 1980, they had them released. And the reason why they had power and jurisdiction is because they had a passport. My question today to you is this. Number one, do you have a passport to the kingdom of heaven? And number two, if you do have a passport to the kingdom of heaven, are you utilizing the rights bequeathed to you as a citizen of heaven? You see, as much as I love this country and I do, my citizenship is not in, in America. I'm a dual citizenship, but my primary residence is in heaven. And that's where I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. I may have not been there yet, but I have a down payment of it now. And if you've given your life to Christ, so have you. So we're going to explain that in a few moments. But listen, everybody, your identity is so important. Your identity is so important. The Bible says in Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Christ. The Bible also says in Ephesians 2.19, which we're getting to next week, so then you're no longer strangers and illegal, or no longer aliens. I put that in there. I don't know why, but anyhow. And aliens, but you are what? Fellow citizens with the saints, remembers of the household of God. That's significant. So today we're going to talk about, do you have a passport to heaven? And if you do, are you utilizing the rights you have for you? When we travel overseas, we often take a picture of our... I was going to bring my passport today, but I had a funny feeling I might lose it. 
I didn't want to. It's a pain in the uh, tail to get, get that passport, so I didn't want to lose it. But this is, the whole, this is the whole thing we've been talking about. Your identity leads to your destiny. Your identity leads to your destiny. And it's very important we know who we are. If we don't know who we are, we'll end up being what we're not called to be. You know, I heard that there was, the, there was an eagle egg that got mixed up in a chicken yard. And this little eaglet broke open and the little chickens, you know, the clocking chickens, began to raise this eaglet. And this eaglet had no idea that it was an eagle, it was a chicken. And they were going around the yard, and they would see these birds soar in the air. And one time, uh, you know, the little chicken saw an eagle in the sky. And she goes, oh, I can't believe how arrogant that thing is. And the little eagle goes, you'll never catch me up on one of those. A lot of us are like that. We're eagles, and we're acting like chickens because we don't know our identity. We allow ourselves to live way below our means, everybody. You are a child of God. If you've given your life to Christ, you are a child of the King. And we're going to look at what that means because your identity leads to your destiny. Make no mistake. There's a reason why the enemy is going after our identity. Always has. The first temptation of Christ, as we mentioned last week, was if you are the Son of God. And now today, there's a demonic attack upon our country, not from any group of people, but there's a spiritual attack and they're utilizing and fooling people. To tell, people are saying now, the very definition of what it means to be a human being is in confusion. And there's no reason for it. It's horrible what's taking place. And we got to make a difference in that, by the way. You have a right as a U.S. citizen, if you're a U.S. citizen, you're voting, you pay taxes, you live in a town, you have every right to make a difference what goes on in the legislation of that town and that school board, right? And so we as Christians, not as Republicans, not as Democrats, not as independents, but as children of the most God, we're called to be salt and light. We're supposed to protect those and help those. And if children are being abused, we have, we have to do our part to make a difference. But we don't do it in anger, we do it with grace and respect. Why? Because identity. You get someone's identity messed up, you messed up their destiny. If the enemy gets you thinking that your sin defines you, then you live the rest of your life in shame and never knowing the full power of his name. Because, my friends, what is very important is your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you. And so we're going to hear this over and over and over, week in, week out. I, I want to get it in our minds that your identity leads to your destiny. You see, we talked about this last week. We often think this, I do, therefore I am. And our culture is even getting this way. Martin Luther King Jr., I'm going to quote him again. It's not, it's, not the, it's not what the person looks like on the outside, but it's the character of the individual. And now our country's saying, if you want to change yourself on the inside, change your outside. It doesn't work. You have to change from the core of who you are. And our identity is not wrapped up in anything else if you're giving your life to Christ. Your identity is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. So, this is a disorder, by the way. You don't hear about disorder? Here's a disorder. I do, therefore I am. That's a disorder. That's a disorder. You know, if you live that way, that means you have to measure up to be a believer. You have to come to church enough. You have to pray enough. You have to forgive enough. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do the other. And you're never good enough because I have to do in order to be received. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not do. It's done. So, here we go. I am Therefore, I do. I am an eagle, so therefore I mount on wings like an eagle, not a chicken. If you don't know who you are, I am, therefore I do. So this is a disorder. This is the right order. Now, does behavior matter? Absolutely, yes. But it's much better to go after your identity. And we all struggle with our identity. We all do. I mean, think about it. How many of you like social media? Uh, yeah, you do? Thank you for being honest. There's one honest man here today. But have you noticed, I'm going to talk to you more. Have you noticed that, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one. You ever go, man, 
I don't, I, I don't have kids like, I, I don't have a house like that. I, I don't look like, I don't have a full head of hair like Mark has. <laughs> right? I, I'm not as skinny as Mark. Mark can eat all the sweets he wants over there. He's fine. If I look at it, I gain 10 pounds, right? It's not fair. So I start judging Mark because Mark is in good shape and he's got a full head of hair and I, I'm working on mine. I have a skin yarmulke on the back because I want to honor my Jewish roots. So I can make fun of me, but don't you dare make fun of me. Is that clear? You know, Pastor, I don't, no, no, no. I get offended then, okay? But, you know, a social media does a wonderful job. What it does, it shows you, and you compare yourself to other people. And by the way, if you feel insecure or superior, that means you got a problem with your identity. Your identity is not wrapped up in Christ. It's wrapped up in who you are. When you go to work, what you drive, what you look like, right? If you go someplace and you feel intimidated because you're not good enough, you're not as pretty as those other girls at the prom, you're not as handsome as the other guys, you don't play sports like the other one, you trip over your own feet. And you feel less than. You know what that is? That's not godly. That's the enemy. You are listening to lies about yourself. You're trying to be somebody else. And then you get jealous and angry. You covet. Then you try to find something wrong with somebody else and get all this complication. You know, God says, you are my son and who I'm well pleased. You're my daughter who I'm well pleased. Be the man or the woman I've called you to be. How much better is that, everybody? It gets rid of all the nonsense, right? All the fire. And by the way, this happens in church. Oh, yes, it does. Well, I'm the pastor of the church. I'm a deacon. I remember one time, a number of years ago, I'm not making this up. He said, I'm a deacon. And he really kind of put staccato on that. Do you know what deacon means? Servant. Hello. Thank you. You help me out today. I preach. This is a good row over here. This is a godly row to help me preach the sermon today. I appreciate it. I therefore I do, okay? Now, our problem is that we often go after the behavior rather than the core of our identity, my friends. That's what we want to do. Change the way you think about yourself. Change your life. If you believe a lie, a lie will lead you to bondage. I'm not good enough. I can't do it. No, don't believe the lies. Christ identifies you. That's what we have to get our identity correct you see, the two most important things, this is a little bit of a review, okay? Because I want to make sure we get this in our heads. It takes seven times to hear something until you get it. This is one of the most important things that you can ever think at any time. There are two thoughts that you must think about at any time that control the vision of your life. And here it is. How you think about God and how you think about yourself will absolutely control your life. How do you think about God? If you think he's angry, upset, a senile, angry old man, you can never please my father, then you're going to live that way. But you look at God rightly, and then what you think about yourself. I am a child of God. I am loved. I'm cared for. I don't have to be anyone else but me. Do you realize, you ever hear someone say, holy sweat? Well, there, you know your sweat is different than anyone else's? I didn't know this. I found this out by reading a book. Imagine that. I read a book and I got this. And the author, Mark Batterson, was talking about in his newest book, Sorry, Thank You, and Please. Good book, by the way. He was talking about it. He's mentioned there's like 252 different chemicals in your sweat that you have a smell no one else has, like a fingerprint. So we're encouraging everyone at Cornerstone, no more deodorant. Be yourself. No more shavers and no more. No, I'm kidding. But seriously, you have a smell. That's why your dog knows who you are. That's why a dog can find a prisoner. That's why cats don't care, okay? So this is what happens. All right, so what we think about ourselves, what we think about God is so and so important. Identity. We cannot find out who we are without knowing who God is. God is our designer. He knows what's best for us, okay? He, if you buy a car, you get an owner's manual, and you should listen to that owner's manual. If you void, if you do not listen to the owner's manual, the manufacturer is not responsible for the problems in your car. In, the same, in many ways, it's the same way. God loves us. He designs us. He knows what works. He knows what does not work. And if we deny his design to our own peril, the design punishes us, not God. 
And so it's very important we know our identity. If we want to change our destiny, we must change what we think about God and we think about ourselves. And I'm so glad we have Ephesians because Ephesians does a masterful job. It is an amazing book of the Bible that the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes the first three chapters of it, deals with the identity of God and your identity. And it helps us to understand our identity, who we are, are and whose we are brings us to the place we should be. And this is the great part of Ephesians. And so I just want to encourage you a little bit about this. Here's a little diagram I've used many times, but it's good. It's not a target to shoot at, but this is a target that explains a little bit what we're like. We're triune beings, and I know some people have different theological. Let's not get into that for now. But we have, for example, you have the body. You have your body. You have your soul, which includes your mind, your will, and your emotions. And then you have a spirit man inside of you. And when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit resides in here. That's why Jesus said, out of your innermost being would flow rivers of living water. He was speaking of the Spirit that was not yet given. So when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And so when you know you're a dead, like for example, a nucleus. In the nucleus, that's the controlling mechanism in the cell. All the information is in there. It's the nucleus. When you have the Holy Spirit inside of you saying who you are in Christ... Every time I read the Bible and spend time with him, what happens, and I, I repent, what happens is I start moving out the boulders of my life. And there is a r roaring river underneath, and I have a well that goes into that. And what happens is I get clogged up, like some of you do, right? And that's, every time you spend time with God, you're getting more clarity when the Holy Spirit becomes clear. And the Holy Spirit will begin to tell you who you are by reading the Word of God. And what happens is you start getting transformed from the inside out. You're cooked thoroughly. You have nothing in you. All the thing from God is inside and emanates out of you. Now, if you do bad behavior, that behavior can kind of seep in here and get and poison you here. Okay? So behavior does matter. But you're much, much better off focusing on this, who you are and the Holy Spirit inside of you. So, now we're going to go to Ephesians, which is the book that Paul wrote. This is about 50 some odd AD. I gave some background last week. I'll give a little more background this week. Paul was a terrorist in the church. He was a Pharisee. He, he punished Christians and even condoned their deaths when he found out about them. And what happened was uh, he had a situation where he was on a road to persecute people. And God basically blinded him and said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who am I persecuting? You're persecuting me, the church. Do you recognize when you persecute each other or treat each other with disrespect, you're not just disrespecting me or the other person, you're disrespecting Christ. Because if someone messes with my kids, they're messing with me. And someone messes with my daughter, they're messing with me. I got a story to tell you, but I'm not going to tell you the story because I'd embarrass my daughter. Let's leave it at that. Okay. I really want to tell it, but I'm not going to say it. Mark, later on, we'll have a conversation. Membership has its privileges, okay? Paul, an apostle, means one that is sent. Of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, God's will, to the saints. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a saint. Oh, when the saints... Oh, when the saints go... I want to... When the saints go... My Come on. Woo. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I like to have fun in church, right? How about you? Yes. You know, I'll be glad when they said unto me, let's go in the house and suck a lemon. No, I'd rather have fun. Okay. So Paul, an apostle, and what does it say? He's a saint. So you are a saint. And you know what a saint means? A child of God. You're in the kingdom of heaven. I know some of you grew up in the Catholic church. We love our Catholic friends. But actually, you know what? In order to be a saint, if you're all a saint, and if you want to go to Catholic way, uh, look out, okay? In order to be a saint in the Catholic Church, you have to be dead. So are you still a saint? Yes, okay. You got to be dead for at least five years. Okay? Five years, dead. And then, not only that, but there has to be some sort of miracle that happened through your life. Either someone evoked your name and a miracle happened, or you were there, and there has to be something beyond you that happens. And then the council gets together, and they vote on it, and they can make you a saint. Okay, so aren't you glad you don't have to go through all that? Aren't you glad you can be alive and not dead? All right. So, 
Paul, an apostle to the saints who are in Ephesus. What's Ephesus? Ephesus is a city we'll talk about in a few moments. And are in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from our God, Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace in Christ. Now, Ephesus was an interesting city in the, Paul, in the day of Paul. It was a metropolitan city. There was about 250,000 people living in this town. In that town, they had, it had an artificial harbor that they built, and they had trade. They had, if you can see there, they had a theater that's still there today, by the way. And they had the temple of Armenus. I can never say it right. Artemis or the goddess of Diane. And they had that as well, which was a bad situation. This is kind of what it looked like back in those days. Kind of a cool place to live if you think about it, right? The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 19, he was there for about three, two and a half to three years. He taught in a local school and, uh, and all from Ephesus, which is a great trading route from all around the world, the gospel was spread through that. Not only that, but if you look, continue to look here, this is an, actually a replica that they built. Looks like something you see in Washington, D.C. Hence, that's why we had such problems with demon temple. Okay, let's move on. But in that temple, you'd walk in, and here is the goddess Diana. And it was, uh, yeah, it, it, it's fertility god. Okay, a fertility god. And they would worship this god. They would bring a sacrifice, and then they'd have sex with the prostitute. I'm not, I'm not making this up. This is what they used to do in those days. It's a pretty pagan City, all kinds of sexual life, all, all kinds of horrible types of things going on. There was violence, there was, uh, there was slavery, people were mistreated, women were second class citizens. It was a bad set of circumstances. This is the culture the Apostle Paul lived in. Listen, everybody, I know we're living in a culture that seems to be going down really quick, and we're supposed to be salt and light and make a difference. But the truth of the matter is, it's a lot worse than the day of Paul. Yet he still managed to see the city changed. They burned all the idols. There's a whole story about it. You can read about it in uh, Acts chapter 19. So in this particular book, the Apostle Paul is now in prison. He's tied to a prison guard. It's probably about 50 uh, A.D. He's tied to a prison guard, and he's writing to the church in the Ephesus region. This is very interesting because the other books, it talks about different people in that city. This is more of a regional letter talking to the general population of this large metropolitan, metropolitan, I can't say the word, metropolitan area. Sea Sally, seashells, seashells sitting by the shore. Okay, I don't remember. If, if Pastor Randy's here, he knows how to say it right. So anyhow, so our identity in Christ. Blessed the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with what? In Christ. In other words, not in yourself. He's blessed us in Christ with some spiritual blessing. No, with what? Every, every spiritual blessing you need is found in in Jesus Christ. Everything you need is found in Jesus Christ. He's the epicenter for whatever we need and whatever we are, right? So bless us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Now check this out, in the heavenly places. So here, this whole book is based upon this. In other words, you have a citizenship in heaven. You have an account in heaven. Jesus says, whatever you do for him and you do in worship, you take with you to the other side. And the Apostle Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And so you can store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Why? Because you have a bank account in heaven. You are a dual citizen in heaven. Let me give you a little example, okay? Here's the kingdom of heaven. By the way, when you think about heaven and earth, we think of heaven's a far off place. No, heaven's right here. The kingdom of heaven's right among you. In fact, sometimes God will, will, will lift the veil. There's another realm right here among you. We're in a time continuum. We're in a certain place where we are, we're governed by time. We're governed by the planets and the light and all that. But God steps out of time. God's like sitting down here, and he can look at all of history, I believe. Again, I think there's enough to say this. He can see the beginning from the end. This is what I believe. This is my personal view, which has enough scripture to back it up. But God is outside of space and time. For example, right now I have friends of mine that are in Australia. They're in a different time zone. God is not bound by our geographical uh, 
celestial lights. He's not bound by the planets. He's not bound by the sun. He's not bound by the ap Apple watch or the Android watch. He's outside of space and time. In fact, Einstein's proved it. And, uh, uh, time is relative and gravity affects... Uh, I, okay, I'll stop because I'll get myself into trouble because I'm not a scientist and I'll be corrected after this week saying, Pastor, you're wrong. Okay, but what I can say is this. Time is relative. Einstein proved it. It's actually been proven. So God's not bound by space and time. Okay? And so what happens is when Christ came, heaven came to earth. And we give our life to Christ, we become citizens of heaven. And what happens is you and I become ambassadors of our home, heaven. Not only are we ambassadors, but we become, we become a place where, what, what are people, where do people run when they're in trouble in another country and they have a passport? Embassy. You and I become little embassies. So when people see you, they should see that you're an ambassador and that you're an embassy. That they can run to you. Not an imbecile, but an embassy. Big difference. Okay? You and I are em embassies. All right? And so the kingdom of God is here. One day what's going to happen is when Christ comes back, this is going to stop and this is what's going to happen. Heaven and earth will become one. So right now in the spiritual realm, there's something going on here. But this is the truth. Right now, God has, has given you and I authority in the physical realm primarily. That's why we do stuff down here. God says, go in my name down here. We have, we're sitting with Christ in spiritual places. But right now, our primary function is in the physical realm. We utilize the spiritual relationship and the spiritual power. But our primary responsibility is in the physical realm. This is where we have the most jurisdiction. Because where God places you, you have the most authority. And because we're in a physical body, we have special authority that even angels don't have. And Satan doesn't even have. That's why he tries to mess with us, because he knows the authority that we have. He tries to trick us to do what he wants us to do by playing mind games primarily. Yeah, there is an angel on one side, there's a demon on the other. It really is that way. Not quite like it is in the cartoon, but there's a battle going on because they understand you have an authority they don't have because you're on the earth. Okay? And this is what happens. So, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chooses us in him before the foundation in the world. You were predestined. Oh, here we go. We're getting to predestination, Arminianism and Calvinism. No, we're not going to go there today. We're going to look at the Bible and say what the Bible says, and that's it. And, and who are we to think what God thinks anyhow? If God only knows, then who's to say that we know? So what happens? Are we predestined? What does the Bible say? It says, what? For God so loved the world, right? He gave his only begotten son that whoever's predestined, whoever what? Believes in him should not die, right? So we know that. So, but does God know what's going on before him? Absolutely. He stands outside of space and time, and he can see the whole timeline. I believe it. It's quite clear he can. Now, there's, there's some, in that timeline, there's still choice. In fact, imagine, if you will, that I'm standing here, over here where the television is. I'm giving the cameras a run for the money today. There is an arch, and in the arch, on top of the arch, it says, Come unto me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Jesus. So you walk, I want Jesus. You give your life to Christ, you walk in. Then you turn around, you look on the other side, and the top of the arch, it says, Chosen from the foundation of the earth. So it can both be at the same time. Christ knows, and you are chosen. In fact, the Bible says that all of us are chosen. The whole world can be saved. The Bible says in 1 Peter, he wants none to perish, but all to come into faith. That's God's will, but we have a choice, and we have to do our part to spread the gospel throughout the earth. So God has chosen us. Look at your neighbor and say, you're chosen. Thank you. But you are what? A chosen, what race are you of? I'm an Italian Christian. I'm a white Christian. I'm a black, no, I'm a Christian that happens to be Italian and, and uh, German. You're not a black Christian. You're a Christian that happens to be African American or black or Hispanic. Do you see that, everybody? My identity is not in my race. It's in my Savior. Right? How much better is that? That solves all the problems right there. You, you are a chosen race. A royal priesthood. A holy, you know what holy means? Set apart. A nation of people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
that we should be holy. You know what holy means? Set apart. Now, how would you like if you came to our house and I'm going to serve you spaghetti and meatballs and I bring a commode and put it on the table? And, so, and I start dishing it out and putting it on your plate. How many of you would want to eat that? And I said, well, I cleaned it. It's our old toilet, but we cleaned it. It's set apart. Would you use that? No, that's a vessel for dishonor. <laughs> All right? If you want a vessel for honor, you probably use the china that we don't have. Okay, China, you know what China is? not a country. China is a place where you'd have these dishes that my grandmother used to have. She only used them twice a year. Okay? In our, in our house, we have china called paper plates. <laughs> and we love our paper plates, except sometimes they break through when I mean, you have a white shirt. But anyhow, we believe in helping the environment. So that's why we have paper plates. But let's move on. We want to be set apart for honor so God can put his delicacies upon your life and my life. It's not legalism. He doesn't want to put things on people who are not clean enough to deliver. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. So we should be holy, blameless before him. He predestined. That's right. He understands what's going to happen before him for us as adoption. You know what adoption was in the time of Christ, in the times of the Romans? Back in those days, women didn't have any rights. Judaism had more rights for women than most surrounding cultures. So if you were going to die, you had no son, no daughter, and you wanted to carry on your legacy to somebody else, you could adopt somebody. And if you adopted somebody in that day and age, it was the same, perhaps even stronger than an actual physical birth because it could not be erased. They were adopted. So you got all the rights, all the privileges of that adoption. So that's what it means, adoption to himself as sons. And look at your neighbor and say, you're a son. Even if you're a woman, you're a son. Pastor, you're woke. Now, I'm not woke. Okay? We're all sons of God. You see, you have to understand, if you're a son, all the rights can be passed down to you. The Bible's not eliminating sex. What he's saying is we all have equal rights before God. All the, all the things of heaven are available to us today as well. We have adoption himself as sons through, through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of what? Adoption as what? That's right. You're biblical. So you say, yeah, I'm a son of God. Okay? S-O-G. Okay? So you're a bunch of S-O-Gs. Praise God. <laughs> By whom we cry out, Abba, which means God, Daddy. Okay? We call Daddy God. So God has chosen us. God has adopted us. And here's the next one. Which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of the trespass, which is sin, according to the riches of his grace, which he's lavished, which means a lot upon us. I heard of a story a number of years ago about an 11-year-old boy who loved boats, and he bought this uh, boat kit and put it together, a beautiful wood boat, about three or four feet big, and it was a sailboat. He spent weeks and weeks and weeks painstakingly built this boat Put, sail, put his initials in the bottom and painted it and played with it, put it in the bathtub. Finally, he said, I'm ready to launch this thing into a real lake. So he went to the lake, had his bathing suit on. His parents were at the beach. He was there with the, with, the, with the boat. He's pushing it. And all of a sudden, he built it so good that the wind came and took a hold of that boat. It started going further and further. He tried to catch it. It was too late. It kept going. He's like, ah, my boat. He kept going further and further and further and further. And before you know it, he couldn't even see it anymore. He began to cry. He said, Mom, I lost my boat, the boat that I made, the boat I spent all my time on. It's gone. I can't find it. So he's devastated. He's very crying about it. Goes back home. A couple of weeks go by. He's going through town. And he goes by a, a hobby store, which they sell kind of like, you know, bottles and stuff. And he sees his boat in the window. He's elated. My boat, which was lost and I made, is found. He goes in. He puts his arms around it, picks it up. so excited. And the owner of the store goes, hey, 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 what do you think you're doing? Well, this is my boat. I made it. Uh-uh. He said, I paid good money for that. If you want that boat, you're going to have to pay for it. So the boy looks sad. He said, I'm going to get that boat. So he went home, and he began to make the bed and do all the things he's supposed to do. He started cutting the lawns and all that kind of stuff. He got enough money after th several weeks. He went back to that hobby shop, and he said, sir, I'm buying that boat. 
And he laid down the cash. He grabbed that boat. He says, boat, you're twice mine. I made you. I designed you. I lost you. And I paid for you twice. You're twice mine. That's exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us. He was made by him. He designed you. He knows your name. But we've drifted into the sea of sin. We've gone to the horizon of lost, and Christ did everything he could for us. He loved us so much, but we had a price on our head, and he paid for us with his own blood and redeemed us. That's called redemption. You are redeemed by grace. So God has chosen us. God has adopted us. God has redeemed us. And the Bible says, making known to us the mystery of his will. You know, people read the Bible. They have PhDs. They can read Hebrew and Aramaic. And, um, and Greek, and that they don't even know who Christ is because there's a veil over their eyes. When you give your life to Christ, the veil, the mystery is lifted, and all of a sudden you start reading the Bible, and the Bible starts reading you, and you start getting the mysteries of God. The God begins to show you his will. The best way to know God's will, his unknown will, is to follow his known will. And as we follow his known will, the unknown will of God becomes clearer. If you sit there waiting for God to move, the best thing for you to move in obedience. Whatever God told you in the light, don't doubt in the darkness. Keep going the same direction what he told you to do, and he'll show you the way. And so making us the mystery of his will known to us, to his purpose, which he set in Christ as a plan for the fullness and time to unite all things in him, in heaven and things on earth. So God has chosen us. God has adopted us. God has redeemed us. God makes known to us the mystery of his will. And here's another one. But our citizenship is in what? Heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body into the like of his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. And so very clear here, in him we have obtained the inheritance, having been predestined according to the will of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were in the first hope in Christ might be. So we're the mystery of Christ, and God has given us an inheritance, an inheritance that is ours in Christ Jesus. Jesus. And the beautiful thing is, it's an inheritance that's available to us. The riches of heaven are based upon us because of what Christ has done for us. Not only that, but our citizenship is in heaven. I don't know what's going on here. Um, okay. Uh, there's something going on here. We'll figure out next, next service, which is not a next service. Okay. But we go here to uh, back to Ephesians. In him, you also, when you were heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were what? Sealed. Sealed, like almost branded. If you go to the Texas, they'll brand the cattle, okay? Sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what a seal is? It doesn't go, uh, uh, no, not that. A seal is something they'd had in the days of antiquity. I'll show you. This would be a seal. And so you'd have a signet ring, the king or something. And this is the ring he'd have with a seal on it. And so what happened is, if you could send a scroll, they would get a scroll, and they'd write down what was in that scroll. They'd get wax, they'd melt the wax, and he'd put a seal on it. And if it, that seal was there, you know it's from the king. And so the Bible says you're sealed in the Holy Spirit. That God, God's a living seal. That you're sealed, that you're branded with the kingdom of heaven. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. If you're giving your life, God has chosen us, God has adopted us, God has redeemed us, God has made us known to us, the mystery of his will, God has given us an inheritance and sealed with the Holy Spirit. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, all who received him and believed in his name, what does all mean? All. He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. I ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, in Jesus' name right now, all of us in this room, myself included, Lord, we struggle with our identity. God, we try to be something on our own strength. Lord, we try to match up to our neighbors. We try to match up to other people in our industries. 
We try to match up to people around us. And Father, we, we, we're sorry for allowing ourselves to become either haughty, apathetic, or depressed based upon the values of other people. Lord, we want to divorce ourselves from comparing ourselves to anyone else but you. And Jesus, when we compare ourselves to you, who's anyone anyhow? We thank you that in you that we were redeemed. We're loved, we're bought, we're sealed. And Father, I pray right now, we want to repent of looking for our identities in things rather than you. For we choose to be seated with you in heavenly places, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you a question. If you were to die today and, and you had a passport, do you have the passport of heaven? Do you have the passport of heaven? What would happen if you went to the customs? Would you be led into, into heaven? Well, I believe in Jesus. I go to church. I'm sorry, sir. This is a false passport. You see, in order to have a passport, which is several things you have to do. Number one, you have to get a passport. You have to apply to it. You get the passport. They do a search to make sure you are who you say you are. And then you have to sign. You have to sign the passport. And your picture has to be on the passport. You have to put yourself in Jesus. He's the passport. You have to sign your life over to him. Now, how do you do that? You believe he exists. He rose again from the dead. That's great. Not enough. There's one other thing you have to do. You have to step down from being God and say, I'm not God anymore. Jesus is God. I submit to him. He's my God. He's my designer. He's my father. I will trust in him. I'm not in charge. He's in charge. If you've not done that, you have a false passport. I don't care if you know about the passport. You may have it in your hand, but the only way you get the application is you have to sign your name on it. You have to put your image on that passport, and then it's accepted. My friends, the beautiful thing is none of us can do it, and the beautiful thing is we can all do it through Christ. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads one more time. We had several in the last service. I'm going to ask you today. I'm going to pray a prayer of commitment to Christ. If you've never given your life to Christ, today is the day of salvation. How many of you would say, Pastor, if I were to die today, I frankly don't know if I would go to heaven. Or maybe I've walked away and I'm not serving God and I want to get right. Can I just see a quick show of hands until I see you? Put your hand up if, you, if that's you today. Thank you. Anyone else today? Thank you. Thank you. Several said thank you. In the middle section here, anyone in the middle section? Thank you. Anyone else today? Life Christ, thank you. Okay, everybody, listen, everybody. This is the beautiful thing. It's not about Cornerstone Church. It's about Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask all of us to say this prayer together out loud and mean it from your heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. Today, I choose to step down from being in charge of my life. You are God, and I am not. I fully give my life to you. Come into my life. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, both known and unknown. Thank you that I am now your child. I'm a son of God. In Jesus' name. Amen.